All right. Good evening, everyone. We are all set for the live broadcast stream of today's Health and Human Service Committee meeting at 6 p.m. on HPA TV, Comcast, and Frontier Government Channels 96 and 6032. It will also be streamed via hpatv.org, the HPA TV Facebook page, and HPA TV's Roku TV, Apple TV, and Amazon TV apps. It will also be rebroadcast and made available on the HP. PA TV YouTube channel. So uh, officially bringing this meeting to order, let me comment on everyone that is here. Um, so to uh, first person is Councilman Mictum. Hello, Councilman Mictum. Uh, we have uh, Lydia Cologne, who is the legislative liaison for my council office. We also have Director Arroyo, Health and Human Service Director. We have Councilwoman uh, Marilyn Rossetti, who is a voting member. We have uh, Attorney Osborne from Corporation Council Office. We have Martha Page from Food and Policy, right? Food Policy? We have Violet Haldane from the Advocacy to Legacy Project. We have uh, Devon Chambers. I'm not sure, Devon, which, which item are you testifying on? Violet, is Devon with you? Yeah, he's with me. Okay, and is Action Travel with you as well? Yes, I don't think she'll be speaking though, but she's okay. with me. Well, uh, all right, Action Travel, th well, thanks for joining us. So we'll get started. And so item number 2.1, okay. Item number 2.1 is Councilman Mictum and, and Councilwoman Hercules. It's a resolution for a study on the North End Grocery Store. I believe that this was amended or updated, but Councilman Mictum, if you can uh, let us know what's going on and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, uh, Councilman LeBron. Yeah, it, the version that's online is the original version. Unfortunately, I had I had in response to the criticisms or the the feedback from last time uh, that this was before this committee. I did draft a new version. So I don't know. I sent. I just realized that the new version wasn't online, and I had emailed you and Lydia a little, but it was very shortly before. So I think the only other voting member is who's here is Councilwoman Rossetti. I could just email uh, it to her. No, uh, yeah, I can share it. Would you like me to share it on my screen, um, Councilman Mictum? Sure, if you could, because I think, it, and I, as you do that, I'll just explain what the, the difference is between my first draft and the draft that I'm, I'm circulating now. <clears throat> Here you go. I think it should be in the entire screen. Can everyone see this? Could you, could you enlarge it a little bit? Enlarge, Council, yes. Councilman? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So basically, when I when I had and I'll, I'll summarize so that you don't really have to read it. But when I had initially proposed this, I said that I it was calling on um, the Department of Development Services simply to contract a consulting firm to do a study of the feasibility of a city owned and operated grocery store. And the feedback that came from uh, both uh, the director of DDS and others at the first go round was we should study all of the options. We should have a study that looks at all of the options. And so I redrafted this to reflect that it should say, and you can see, I think it's in the, maybe the first or second resolved, but it says study the likely cost of a city owned grocery store, a privately owned grocery store or a public private partnership. And really the goal here is, Let's think. I mean, we know we have tried to get a public grocery store in the North End for as long as most of us have been alive uh, without success. And so, my hope is that we can get a little analysis on what would it take in terms of tax abatements and other incentives to get the private version versus what would it cost us both in terms of upfront setting up cost and ongoing operational cost to operate a publicly owned version 
or some public private partnership, just so that we have some really solid numbers on what is this going to cost one way or the other. So that's, that's my, my proposal. I, when the di director was here, director of development services, I was, I couldn't be here, but I did watch it afterward. And he said, the DDS had studied the publicly owned grocery store and determined that it wasn't feasible. I don't, I don't think that's actually true because when I first brought it up to him some months before that, he said, Oh, we never looked into that. We'll have to look into that. And then he came here and said they'd studied it. And so I emailed him and um, Ms. Rothschild and I said, please share with me your studies and what you found. And the answer was silence. And I did follow up a few times. So I don't think there's been a comprehensive study of a publicly owned grocery store in Hartford and so I'm just saying we should study it because maybe we can solve this problem a different way than we've tried. Thank you, Councilman <clears throat> McDum. Um, was that all, uh, Councilman? Yeah. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Rosetti. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Councilman Mitchum. You know, a couple of things. As someone who was involved, you know, pre baseball stadium, when there was going to be a grocery store and ShopRite was the operator and you know all the work that went into that and the discovery of you know different things around groceries that I, I never knew and just the area, food desert. I know proximity, people thought it was downtown, but it actually fit well into with bus lines and others, uh, the food desert area and certainly we can look into this and I support this fully, but a lot that I learned out of that was even people who operate grocery stores for a living have a hard time operating grocery stores. So I think a part of it is not to dismiss, let's look at alternatives. And I, and I really support this again, because I really, to this day, think we would have a full service shop right grocery store right there, but instead we have baseball stadium, but that's another whole discussion. Um, um, so I want to make sure though, Councilman Mitchum, that for the people who continue to work on it, um, you know, Rex Fowler and, um, um, oh, oh my God, I can't think of her name right now. People who are continuing to work on it, that we don't not utilize their knowledge and, you know, wherewithal to make sure that we don't, and, you know, I'm glad, you know, yeah, we need to get director of development services, but let's also get the people who've had feet on the street and been dealing with this and have the knowledge. Don't, don't necessarily, I'm just going to say, depend on them to tell us what, what are the things. So I know that Rex and remind me, Martha, what's the name of the group? You're on mute. Yeah. It's the community action task force with Denise. Denise, Holter. Yeah, Denise yeah. Holter, that's what I was thinking of. So I, I want to make sure we don't, we we utilize the knowledge and maybe so we're, instead of starting from here, we're starting from here and then maybe go off in some different avenues. But I, I fully support this. I just want to make sure that, and there's others too, that we work collaboratively. Let's not, and also no offense, let, let's not just depend on our city. So, you know, however I can be useful, I, I, I would absolutely like to be. So um, I applaud you in this, but I also want us to make sure we, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Rosetti. Uh, Ms. Page? Um, yeah, I would, I just want to echo a little bit of what Councilwoman Rosetti had to say. And in addition to utilizing the knowledge, there have been um, market studies in that area. There there has, there's also been groups that have worked on the concept of a co-op. So it, if, if there, I'm a, I'm a big fan of looking at all the alternatives that exist, but let's not start from a blank sheet of paper because we don't have a blank sheet of paper. There has been a lot that has been looked at. Um, I'm pretty certain in everything that I have seen, both through the commission and also with the work with the uh, Community Action Task Force and the Healthy Hartford Hub, I don't recall ever seeing any sort of study around city ownership of a grocery store. Um, I think it's that's that's fraught, but it's worth studying if we're going to look at all alternatives. But let's let's make sure that we pull together everything that's been done over the last four or five years so that if a consultant is going to look at this, that they don't have to start from square one. Thank you, Ms. Page. Um, Councilman McDum. Just give me one second, and I know you. I know you have to 
I, I'm interested to see what Director Arroyo has learned and how it how it um, interplays with the Health and Human Service Office. Do you see the um, lack of a grocery store impact services um, director in your work? Sorry to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer. You know. It, you know. Um, can you all hear me? I'm sorry. I'm using yeah. my AirPods. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Um, I've been involved uh, more deeply and then tangentially over my five years here with different iterations of the CADIF and, and the work that uh, Martha and others have done. And even the, the city health department was involved at one time with some funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and some of this work. And so we definitely see, I will say, an impact on our budget. One of our biggest expenses in my budget is our work around the Dollar Ride program. Dollar Ride is providing rides to our seniors, at least, to um, grocery stores. So we have, obviously, our only full-service grocery store on the south end. We take our seniors there. We take our seniors out of the city in order to access um, the full-service grocery store. And so it is something that we do see as that is needed, um, at least uh, amongst our population of elderly that do not have vehicles. And we would obviously extend that to a larger population throughout the city. We know that having access to fresh fruits and vegetables and other health needs, and, and so it's not just a grocery store. I think the, the beauty of the work that has been done that Martha has referenced is the fact and that the CADIF has really taken a big interest in is, is creating, using the uh, a grocery store as a mechanism to bring other resources in. And the health department has discussed if this was something that was to come to fruition and the ability to also have these wraparound services through the Hart uh, Hartford Healthy Hub, that we would be interested in co-locating some services there, at least um, on, a, on a regular basis. So sort of like our WIC program having our WIC program be there to be able to help our uh, young parents that are accessing our WIC program and things like that. So it's definitely something that we would love to see happen to have a second, at least a second full service grocery store in the city, uh, because we know that there's definitely a need. So director, um, I Councilman Mictum, I'm not, I, I just I just want, while well, I have it um, here. Um, Director, using our seniors as a control group, the so there, so uh, let me call a thing a thing, right? Um, so we do have Save a Lot on Main Street. There is a Bravo's. Uh, my grandmother loved Bravo's on Garden Street. My grandmother lived on Garden Street. Bra Bravo's was on Albany Avenue. I would have to take her from time to time. Um, she loved it. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, I think that is the only two stores. Uh, there's, also, there's also C Town, not necessarily on the north end, but we know that some people from the north end. Yeah, yeah, C Town in the south. Yeah, yeah, C Town. Then you have Key Foods. Right. And there's um, Carlos Supermarket on um, Farmington. And yeah, there's Carlos. I mean, I mean, and, and so I guess the question is right for the seniors. Do they have options, or are we just bringing them there? Like, I want to hear what their voice is. What, what, how, how do they consider those other stores? So we know that they're going to those stores. We often hear from our seniors, and and we haven't to, to be to be upfront and fair about this. We've not done a survey in a while mm -hmm. with our seniors. It is something that um, we have to do again. Um, However, we we do listen to our seniors. So at one point, our seniors, uh, we were taking them to Big Y. They told us they didn't want to go, go to Big Y. In West Hartford, we eliminated that run. And in eliminating that run, we had larger conversations about where those things would be. So currently, like I said, we do we do the stop and shop in Capaco. I think I always say it wrong. <laughs> we do it in Capaco because we hear from our North End seniors that that's where they find a lot of the West Indian uh, sundries and foods that they want. So we have a run there. We have a run on the south side to the stop and shop there because again, you get a lot of the Puerto Rican products and Latino products there. And then we also have a run to the Walmart. So you get a, a little bit of that 
less right, variety right. on the food service side, right. but it's also a place where we know our seniors have access to other things that they may need. Right. And so because they have a large, it's a, you know, what they used to call them. One-stop shop, yeah. <laughs> yep, they, they go there and they get their groceries and they get whatever other things they need. We did at one point add a key food um, to that. Then they decided they didn't want key food. So we do listen to them and we try to modify the runs that they're looking for based on that. Um, and so that everyone is aware, we have preset runs that go to each of our uh, senior housing complexes. So mm -hmm. they'll have a day a week or a day every other week. I, I don't recall exactly right now. I think it's a day a week where there'll be a preset run. So we do this, this senior housing, this senior housing, this senior housing. We drop them off at the Walgreens, at the Walmart, and that's there. We drop them off the stop and shop. Then we, we circle back around. But we also have runs where seniors that are not living in senior housing can also get a run as well. So that's also happening. We try not to leave folks out. We understand that not all of our seniors may be income eligible for senior housing or are living in senior housing. And so we try to do that. But we do listen to them um, as things bubble up and percolate. We try within the best of our ability to meet those needs. And usually we, we do, we don't want one person asking. We ask for several, you know, that there's right. more than one person asking. Uh, so I just want to introduce uh, Majority Leader uh, T.J. Clark has joined us, who's also a voting member. Uh, Councilman Mictum, then Councilwoman Rosetti. Uh, thank you. And I, I wanted to respond to what Ms. Page and Councilwoman Rosetti had said um, before. And I, I'm going to have to I have to get off in a few minutes. But I, I, I appreciate very much. I mean, one, that we should that any study, anything we do should include Denise, Rex, all the folks who have been doing this work and also any you know reports or substantive uh you know documents that have been generated and i i would just put out there that if that is if that makes sense i would happily revise this to sort of say specifically you know to say that the study should include consultations with community leaders and activists who have worked on this issue in the consideration of prior studies Maybe to make, I mean, I would hope it would include that anyway, but maybe we'd be explicit. So we're making sure we don't, um, we don't leave anything out. Okay. Councilwoman Rosetti. And through you, Mr. Chair, you know, when we talk, you know, there's also the definitions of a grocery store, you know, it's by square footage. You know, I know we mentioned certainly there are other availability of food products in this city, but you know, when we were looking at it back, before they built the stadium, I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, it was about access to healthy foods, uh, certainly access to diverse foods, but access to foods, you know, more product, more economical. You know, the smaller a, a place is, more overhead. So you're paying, you were going to get a bigger bang for your buck. And 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 this shop rate operator, they're all, all, all owned by, you know, a local, not a local, they're all owned by somebody and they all have to agree to, it was really interesting to know how they did it, but we also learned a lot about the differences and how much more people were spending by certainly, I'm not dismissing all these local markets because they do serve a purpose, but if we could have something to the size that we're talking about, it is about it is about the finances. It is about how far your dollar would stretch. It is about a healthy product. It is about having access. So I, you know, I applaud this, and I, I you know, we can either add uh, Councilman Mitchum a friendly amendment. I, you know, I don't. We don't have to reinvent the wheel again. I just want to make sure that we don't leave that part out. I want to build from that, and then we can take it from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Rosetti. I just, um, since we have uh, a lot of agenda items and Councilman Mictum, you have to leave. Um, I think we all in agreement that um, uh, our folks, you know, having a full service grocery store, if we're using that language, right? We have one in the South End and um, and um, having one uh, in, in the North End would make sense. I, I think everyone agrees on that. And then having access to healthy foods. I oh, think one more thing, Mr. Chair. Yes, yes. Oh, and, then I'll, and then I'll stop. It's all coming back to me now, you know, and also depending on what part of the, you know, the swath of the food desert, there was funding available. That was the right. other thing where it would be built. You would have access to capital. So keep that in mind. Also, it's not just where you put it, but you want to have this, the dollars to be able to also build it. Now I'll stop. Yeah. I think and so you're, you're right in terms of, and that's part of, you know, all of these things, I think trying to solve it in a bubble, 
I think the theme of what I've heard from everyone is that there's so many different factors. The one thing that I would say is, is that I think we're aware we aligned. Well, we're all aligned on that. There need we need access. We need access to a full service grocery store. We need access to healthy food and healthy food options. And I think our seniors are telling us um, um, with just with the dollarized system. The other thing too I want to acknowledge is the budget piece. Oftentimes, we or not just anyone we the larger system, right? Rather be a municipality, the state, nonprofits for, you know, we, we do these consulting things or we hire consultants to do studies. We get them and then we put them on a shelf and um, then they collect dust and then nothing happens with them. I think that we have an opportunity to look upon the past and the wisdom that has been done in the past and see if there's any gaps in that and then build upon that and then see, you know, what do we have in the bank, in the toolkit um, to see what it is that, you know, uh, we would need. Um, so that way we're not solely reliant on a department and probably in particular one person or a handful of people. Why not bring more people into the conversation? So the question I have for you, Ms. Page, is this community action task force the concept of a grocery store in the north end is where is that on your goals is that part of your bullet points where where does that fall it is it's 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 essentially the centerpiece but director arroyo pointed out something that's important it isn't just the grocery store it is grocery store plus health promoting services grocery store plus the ability to enable residents to take care of their own health through like not only access to healthy food, but um, I think that the concept that's been floated with the planning and zoning folks is like a health district, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm so the grocery store- I'm so sorry, I have uh, to leave. I just you gotta to leave? I gotta go, but I thank you all. I'm sorry that I'm stepping out and I'm sorry no. to interrupt you, Ms. Page. No problem, Council Mickton. We'll follow up tomorrow. I promise, uh, you know, it won't thank go away. So no yeah, way. so it is, so the grocery store remains the centerpiece and it remains the centerpiece as much for the fact that a full service grocery store is needed and there is data and studies that, that demonstrate that, um, but that it is a matter of um, community fairness that folks shouldn't have to go all over creation in order to get good groceries. Um, so there is, so it, 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 like, you know, it serves multiple purposes, but very much a grocery store is a part of that mix. Right. Uh, uh, Majority Leader uh, Clark. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for a point of clarification, what resolution are we uh, discussing? Oh, so we're discussing Council uh, uh, Men Mictums and Councilwoman Hercules, the resolution for a study on the North End Grocery Store. Okay, <clears throat> that's what I thought. So um, I know this committee and council already passed the resolution regarding identifying a grocery store location in the North End that I had authored and many of our colleagues have signed on to. I think um, we are past that point of doing a study uh, because I know Ms. Page and some others from UConn and other um, institution partners uh, have been discussing this for the past 10 years. I think we are really at the point uh, where we just need to work with development services uh, and others, <clears throat> uh, other state partners to really identify a location and means for funding. Uh, because my conversations with uh, individuals that are in the grocery store business is the fact that the way that grocery stores were uh, are, are erected and run uh, have changed uh, and they are very much concerned regarding the overhead. And so uh, the socioeconomic status of the neighborhood makes sense. And also too, with the um, uh, looking at it through a, another lens as to what more can it be if, than just a full service grocery store. So it can't be, as I'm, I'm told by experts, it can't be the size of a stop and shop that we have in Capaco or on um, uh, New Park Avenue. Uh, it could be um, 
we have to think about it through the lens of maybe the size of an Aldi's because of the fact that now with the um, new state of the art systems for Instacart and uh, other food delivery systems that the grocery store may do. Uh, th- th- so those are some certain concepts that uh, need to be discussed. I think that there are locations that uh, we have discussed uh, with development services and also too through CRDA uh, that um, can be developed. The problem is the bottom line is funding. And so that funding uh, has to come from the city of Hartford. So there's, there, here's, the, here's the dynamic that we should be really discussing what funds do we have within the city uh, city's coffers, and what additional by what additional means can we get from the state uh, or federal government to uh, help to alleviate uh, the food desert that we have in uh, North Hartford? So, uh, uh, Majority Leader, um, are you saying that we're okay? So, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying like we're beyond a study, like we need to just a, a call to action, if you will. That that is correct. We are yeah. we are we are beyond the study. So I would I, I definitely agree with you on that. And so I think the question would be how do we come together and leverage uh, that? Um, I think what what also needs that uh, majority and I, and I, just a question for you. I think from what I, when I talk to residents and talk to community partners and. It sounds to me that you're much more versed in speaking to uh, the business folks and understanding the landscape of what a grocery store looks like today from what it looks like, you know, maybe a decade ago. I think, but what the community is asking for is some level of transparency that there's efforts being made. And so what I don't want to do, or I don't think would, I'm going to use this word, I, Marilyn, don't, don't, um, Councilman Rosetti, don't get at me, behoove us. Mm-hmm. to um, the majority leader, I know you're going to laugh, but like to do something where where we can provide transparency uh, with those conversations instead of saying, okay, it's a call to action on our council side. Let's go behind closed doors and force the issue. So majority leader, what do you think um, that uh, uh, the next step would be or what, what would your ideas be on um, not only executing and and calling to action this item, but also providing the transparency that the community craves. Um, Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. I have no means of participating and I know people hate the word task force, but if there needs to be a task force uh, that needs to be convened or community meetings, I have no problem uh, sitting on that and discussing this in the public because, uh, you know, it's already known that I've I've been trying to champion, help help this effort, regarding alleviating the food desert uh, in the North End. And I want to be clear, I don't want a grocery store, this is me talking, I don't want a grocery store located in a downtown area where the folks that have to drive up, Albany, drive down Albany Avenue or Main Street have to access. I know that that's been a one of those uh, parcels, but then don't know has been discussed. I fundamentally believe a grocery store needs to be strategically placed in a neighborhood where our individual, where our residents that we serve have access to that by means of, you know, whether it's um, their own transportation or public transportation. Because as you stated before, when I got on, there is a uh, grocery, full service grocery store located in the South End. And I, I would say there too, there's in Walmart and Walmart Plaza, as well as uh, the stop and shop uh, in North Hartford. Uh, we don't have uh, those those means of um, accessibility to those full size grocery stores. We got to either go to West, uh, sorry, West Hartford, yes, Bloomfield, or Windsor. Oh, Windsor. Yeah. And so yeah. that's where that's where my position is. It needs to be placed in a neighborhood uh, that is that is in North Hartford. And again, I have no problems. Uh, calling uh, calling a uh, public meeting together to discuss ideas to see what the community may want. We definitely can uh, receive input from those that have been working on this uh, project over the years, especially the our partners at UConn, uh, to eat to to really say this is a location that we should be uh, considering, uh, or it's so, the type of foods as well. Right. Um, so, uh, Councilman Rosetti, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. So, uh, just one second, uh, Miss Page. Do you think since you have a task force, again, it's not focused on 
you know, this specific topic, this specific topic being part of a larger topic. Do you think that um, this would be something that we can put as an agenda item and give it some leverage and or energy and or transparency that the community craves with support of uh, the Health and Human Service uh, Committee? Um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf. I mean, I'm not the chair of the group. Um, okay. You know, I'm just a member. But in that capacity, I would certainly think that that would be worth having the conversation with Denise, particularly Denise Holter shares the, I mean, chairs the group. So I absolutely think that this is, that they would, that the group would want to be part of any conversation about it because they have been in conversation on this for a really long time. I also think that the other perspective is that this is something that the uh, Food Policy Commission could get behind right. um, and help support because this is obviously right in the wheelhouse of that commission's work as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. Uh, Councilwoman Rosetti? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't suggesting you know, where something would be located. And again, it was some time ago when I worked on this, um, you know, before the uh, stadium was built. I don't know if I mentioned that. But um, I, I do know, and, and that may have changed also, Majority Leader Clark know, knows, I'm sure, much more than this, that the, you know, the area that's designated, geographically designated food desert, there was funding tied to that. I'm sure it's changed. We've had a pandemic since then. But certainly I wasn't suggesting, I'm just, I was just talking about where that spot was, but absolutely it needs to go where need is best. And, um, you know, I'm going to say, okay. thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rosetti. I don't, you know, just, I, I think when you were talking historically about um, the past processes, I don't, I didn't think, I didn't think the inference was for that, but thank you for clarifying that. Um, I appreciate it. Um, okay. So here's what I think. Um, I think, what we should do with the support of the Health and Human Service uh, Committee is to um, have a conversation. Because um, I know Councilman Clark, I know the 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 the, the word that um, no one wants to hear is a task force, right? And so, if we have something built already, how do we bake it in? Get the support and leverage that we need. And we're facing a critical juncture right now with the budget season coming fast upon us. So I think we have a, a great opportunity here to really capitalize on this open window. And so on, on the council, on the council side, we, you know, one of our major or some would argue the most um, important influence that we have is on the budget. So um Ms. Page, the 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 chair's name is Deborah. No, it's Denise Holter. Denise Holter. So, um, Lydia, if you can just write a note. What I would say, uh, Councilman Rosetti and Majority Leader Clark, would you all be interested in having a meeting this week with uh, with Denise Holter um, to talk about if it's an op if it's an opportunity to bake in a task force um, to um, to the items with the support of council? Uh, would you guys be willing to do that? I have no problem to you or even making this here as a suggestion, making it a subcommittee of the Health and Human Services or an ad, sorry, maybe an ad hoc committee of the Health and Human Services. Committee. All right, great. So um, we'll follow up, Lydia, uh, we'll follow up with the um, chairs of the Health and Human Service Committee and uh, potentially Denise Holter. So with that being said, um, for the record, um, so with that being said, I'll take a motion to postpone this. Well, excuse me. I'll take a motion. <laughs> I'll take a motion on item 2.1. Do you, Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we postpone this item until the um, uh, the ad hoc committee has uh, convened. I second. All right. I second. All right. We have a motion on the table uh, and second it. Uh, that uh, we postpone this item until an ad hoc task force has convened. Uh, all, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Let the record reflect. Thank you. Thank you um, for this item. And thank you, Majority Leader Clark, uh, for um, coming in and um, discussing and moving it, the call, call to action. Um, all right, great. So we'll move forward to item 2.2. .2. 
Uh, Mayor Bronin with the company resolution for the city to accept gift cards donations totaling 35,000 from DoorDash's community uh, credits program. Uh, and uh, who's here to talk on this item? Uh, Director, the floor is yours. Very good. Uh, good evening, everyone, again. So uh, this particular resolution and donation of um, credit essentially comes out of the White House uh, conference that they had on fighting hunger and hunger and nutrition that they had in the fall. And essentially, DoorDash was a part of this, and they uh, came to the table with the Biden administration to basically put their money where their mouth is and expand some of the outreach they have been doing. So one of the things that they came up with was focusing on mid-sized cities, which don't often get the attention of rural areas or big cities as it relates to hunger, and um, are providing these credits. These credits are essentially $25 worth of items that you can order via a code through DoorDash. And so we, we, we would be receiving 17,500 year one, which is this year, and $17,500 in credits year two to be used in $25 increments. They have allowed us to design how we would use these credits. And so HHS with an internal group came together and put some parameters about how we would use these, how many we would give out at a time um, and use them to really fulfill gaps that we don't have or are unable to as, as a city agency. Uh, so uh, when we relocate individuals, oftentimes we're relocating them to a hotel that doesn't have um a kitchen or anything like that so they're they are have to use uh either fast food or other services and so DoorDash will allow we can provide them with one or two credits which would be 25 to 50 dollars to at least assist them in this process of purchasing food um it also can be used for uh, personal hygiene products uh infant formula and things like that because it's not just grocery stores or it's not just restaurants, it's also grocery stores, it's also convenience stores like your CVS or, um, or Rite Aid or anything like that. And so that is our plan moving forward is uh, looking at our relocation clients that may need additional assistance if we're opening emergency shelters to be able to provide um, food. If we're doing working with WIC recipients or new WIC recipients who may have fallen off the rolls and we need 24 hours to get them back on, we can provide them with the with the $25 credit to be able to purchase infant formula at a um, at a local at one of our local establishments that uh, works with DoorDash. Um, and then working together as well, we did speak with and will partner with our community engagement team who often will get phone calls from time to time or uh, about situations that arise that we can also provide those credits. And so that's essentially it. It's a one-time donation over two years for us to be able to use. Okay. Any questions from the other council members? <laughs> I do have a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Director. Uh, maybe you did say this and I missed this. How would they be able to um, gain the uh, gift card if they don't have a phone? Because I know many of the gift cards are down, are now accessible via their uh, smartphone. So what if they don't well, have a smartphone? It's a code. If that's going to be challenging. You do have to have the app. You do have to be able to access it. And what we have found um, oftentimes is that most people will have access to, to a phone or someone's, or someone's phone. Um, if you recall during the pandemic, uh, 4CT um, had partnered with the United Way to provide uh, gift cards. That was also an, a numerical number that needed to be used online. Um, so we have some experience with that, it's, but it's not a physical gift card. It is all electronic, unfortunately. Uh, but we would most definitely work with our partners on that. So if we have someone coming into the office and we're having that conversation, then we would obviously work with them to uh, establish that on their phones. Okay, thank you. I am back. Uh, Councilman Rossetti, any questions? No, all right. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to... Uh, 
the chair will entertain a motion for item 2.2. Motion for favorable recommendation back to council. All second. right, we have a second. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Aye, aye. I see none opposed. Motion has been passed. All right, uh, Director, I'm going to inject uh, item 2.5 here. We have advocacy to legacy. We got some young folks on here who have to get to their homework. So um, I'm going to move the agenda a little bit. And so um, for advocacy to le legacy, we have Ms. V uh, Violet Haldane. If you could uh, expl uh, please explain a little bit about the group and the work that you've been doing uh, with the young folks in our community. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, name is Violet Haldane, and the organization is called Advocacy Legacy. And one, our mission is to educate individuals, families, and communities how to advocate for themselves um, in order to change lives. Um, the students that are with me today, there are four on the call who will be speaking. Um, we've been engaged in doing tobacco related work for several years. Um, some of these students worked on the Tobacco 21 legislation. Um, we worked with the city and, you know, some other um, community organizations on it, on that legislation. But essentially, um, we teach young people how the government works, how to bring forth change. And one of the ways is through advocating for themselves on topics that they feel are important to them and um, trying to change laws and policies. So this is a continuation of the tobacco work that we've been working on, I think for over four years. And the students um, are going to speak. They do their research, they um, choose a position, um, they write their position paper, and then they come and present it. And so um, I don't know who wants to go first and they will explain to you what they are um, advocating for on this go around. So are there any volunteers? We have Devon Chambers, Akelia James, Akeem James, and Omar Vinson. Well, I'm going to go with Devon because he was the first one on the phone. Devon, can you unmute? Hello, my name is Devon. Uh, I can't really get my camera going. I'm on my laptop right now and I just realized it doesn't work. But I have my position paper here, right here, and I'm ready to go. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so my name is Devon Chambers. I'm a senior in high school, and I'm an advocate for my community. As of today, there is no policy or law that forbids the selling of tobacco or nicotine products in close proximity of schools. However, there is currently a policy that forbids the selling of alcohol within 500 feet of schools and rec centers. I believe that the policy in place for alcohol should also come into effect for tobacco and nicotine products. This is important for the health of the community. Did somebody talk? Or can nope. I keep going? Okay. Keep going. This is important for the health of the community. When kids walk home from school, they go into local gas stations, corner stores or bodegas, and they see advertisement of tobacco and nicotine products when you first walk into the stores there's the tobacco and nicotine products are right next to the candy and all the other things that the children go into the stores for this is specifically important to me because when I worked for BHCA during their summer youth employment program I worked closely with children and saw some of the children that I worked with walking homes with the tobacco and nicotine products in their hands not only is that unsafe but it's most of all unhealthy for their bodies I believe that limiting or terminating the sell of the selling of tobacco and nicotine products in close proximity of schools will not only benefit the children, but also the health of the community, as well as potentially breaking the unhealthy habit of smoking in the community. We are here today to ask for your support to enact this proximity policy for the betterment of for the better of Hartford as a whole. Thank you. Um, I'll go on to Akilia. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Akilia James. I'm 18 years old. I am a senior at Achievement First Hartford High School, and I'm here to speak about our, our tobacco proximity policy. This policy is to limit the sale or purchase 
of tobacco products 500 feet from schools. This is important to me because as a person of color whose community was and is still being targeted by tobacco products, it would be beneficial for the new generation of black and brown kids to not have these products in their everyday life. By seeing them as they go to school or after school programs, kids are at a very vulnerable stage in their life where they are easily influenced and easily influenced and have a high chance of using tobacco products, such as vapes and things like that. If they begin to use tobacco products, they are prone to lung disease and brain problems. Tobacco products are also one of the major causes of death in the black and brown, black and brown communities because it, heart, it causes heart disease and cancer and stroke. Having this policy put in place will decrease the possibility of kids purchasing tobacco products because it will be out of their reach. I am in favor of this policy, which will limit the sales or purchases of tobacco products 500 feet from schools, and I hope you will support it. Thank you. Akeem? Um, good night. Um, my name is Akeem James. I'm a high school student at Shimmer Forest Harford High School. Um, my reasoning for testifying today is to advocate for tobacco products not to be sold within a 500 feet radius from schools. Um, this, per this policy um, uh, currently applies to alcohol, but not to tobacco products. Um, so when I was doing my research, um, I used some information from the CDC and according to the CDC, um, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, tobacco product usually starts during adolescence um, and they um, like use some data in 2022 and it said um, for every um, four hundred for every hundred middle school students, and one of every six high school students, um, they have reported current use of tobacco products. Um, creating a 500 feet distance between schools and tobacco products, tobacco products selling stores could possibly decrease those statistics of young people smoking. Um, so the overall idea of this policy is to limit adolescent access to tobacco products and Making tobacco, making tobacco products less visible and accessible could possibly remove the, um, like the presence of the, the presence of the product from young people's lives. Um, one of the, one of the things when I was researching, one of the things like I was realizing was that um, the presence of tobacco products is the like it has the same impact as someone who's using it. Like you don't have to use it. Like the presence is like big um it's like a pretty and it, like in my community tobacco products are like dominant like you see it everywhere on the ground in the stores um personally going to school um i would like always smell the tobacco products or see it on the ground um and i never developed the um curiosity to try the product um that's just me but for like um other young people that may be different um I'm in favor of creating a policy that limits the sale of tobacco products within a 500 feet radius of schools. And we are asking for your support to push our policy. Thank you, Akeem. Um, Omar, are you going to My speak? name is Omar. I'm 17 and a junior in high school. Today I'm here with my program advocacy to legacy and we're here to advocate for a change in tobacco laws to be more specific we would like to adopt a policy that alcohol already has which is to be 500 feet away from schools this project is very important to me because it has greatly impacted and depreciated my community in many ways one specific way is the advertising that big tobacco companies do which is very appealing to the eye especially young kids, children who come out of school every day and see the tobacco products right next to the candies and toys they would buy in the stores, gas stations, and bodegas. Big tobacco companies put their vapes, e-cigs, and many other products on shelves right in front of you as soon as you walk into the store. And as you're checking out with their products leaving, they're right in front and behind the store curtain next to all candies and toys that others and other products that attract young children, especially in this new generation we live amongst. The American Lung Association states that smoking tobacco, vapes, and 
e-cigs can cause black lung disease, otherwise known as coal dust, coal dust disease. This is very bad for my community because it not only impacts our parents and grandparents, but it's getting into the younger generation's mind. Hey, um, so that's four of the students that were able to join us this evening. Our ultimate goal is to reduce youth smoking. Um, in Connecticut, the high school tobacco use rate is 28.7%, and smoking costs the state over $2 billion a year and over 4,900 lives. Um, youth are particularly vulnerable to peer pressure, and tobacco companies use strategies um, to get the users hooked early, particularly in packaging, marketing, and location in stores. Nearly nine in 10 cigarette smokers had their first cigarette by age 18. And I know that 21 is the legal age in Connecticut to purchase it, but um, students do have access. Retailers are disproportionately located in low income communities and communities of color. And research shows that restricting retailers from locating near schools can reduce income and race-based disparities in racial retail density. So um, our, our ask is that tobacco, nicotine products, which includes e-cigarettes, cigarellos, et cetera, not be able to be sold within 500 feet of schools. We came up with the 500 feet number because we've discovered that in the state of Connecticut, there is no um, legislation anywhere that um, says where you cannot sell cigarettes near schools, but there is regulation for alcohol. Um, the, the distance varies by town. In Connecticut, the distance is 500 feet. In Bloomfield, it's a thousand feet, but we are going, we are requesting that we have the 500 feet um, distance in Hartford as it, we feel it would be easier to monitor and um, implement since we already do it for um, alcohol. We did try to look at what, how many stores would be impacted. And we do want the stores to be grandfathered that currently sell these products within a 500 feet limit. And right now um, we think there are only two, um, Global Academy on Edward Street. And I guess it depends on if the 500 feet starts at the school or if it starts at the end because there's a football field. Um, that goes to Albany Avenue. If it ends at the football field, the stores across the street sell tobacco and the gas station sells cigarettes. But if it's where the school is, they may not be impacted. And the other school that would be impacted at some point would be, I think it's called Parkville up on Park Street. So um, maybe the temporary Buckley School, there's, one, there's a temporary location in Buckley and I couldn't determine if that was within 500 feet or not. But um, in looking you know, throughout the city, we think those are the only schools that at some point would be impacted. And as we're saying, the 500 feet, if a store currently sells the products, they would be grandfathered. But going forward, um, you know, new owners, et cetera, we would hope that um, they would not be able to sell the product. So uh, we're open for questions. Yes, so I uh, just, Miss Haldane, I want to thank you for your continued work and um, the wonderful presentation uh, by all of the uh, scholars, the young scholars. They did a fabulous job. It's amazing. But Majority Leader Clark has a question or his hand raised. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you and Miss Haldane. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, hear the great work that the advocacy, the legacy, uh, program is doing. Uh, I remember when you had me come um, do a presentation before the kids and it was a very uh, and, and, uh, enlightening experience. Um, my question on your policy recommendation. Yes. Are these for new establishments 
or is it um, would um, would this um, policy recommendation uh, restrict those um, uh, shops that are selling cigarettes, uh, restrict them from selling it moving forward? It's for new establishments. If you're grandfathered, you can continue selling. Um, you know, unless the store changes ownership, then if it changes ownership, you know, you would not. So ex existing stores would be grandfathered. Okay. In locations would be grandfathered. Okay. That was going to be my follow-up question just so that I was, a, uh, I was clear. Thank you uh, for that clarification. Could you do me a, uh, a small favor? Yes. Can you e email the policy recommendations to us? because I would like to uh, read them again in um, a little bit more detail. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Rossetti, any uh, comments? No, I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with it, but I also wanna thank uh, the folks who spoke tonight because it really is important and I hope you continue to speak out on this and other things, and we welcome you at the committee. Thank you. Yes, and I just want to say, although they didn't show their camera, I did visit them, and they are students because uh, they presented <laughs> like college adults, college slash adults. I was, I was uh, you know, through you, Mr. Chair. I was, <laughs> I wasn't going to ask for uh, identification, but yes, <laughs> very, very mature and very professional. But I think that just speaks to right. commitment and and Miss Haldane leadership. So thank you. Yes. So um, following uh, Majority Leader Clark was reading my mind and, um, you know, we're definitely going to follow up with uh, policy recommendations. Uh, and so um, we'll definitely have those emailed to us, uh, Ms. Haldane. Uh, so Majority Leader Clark. No, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to uh, roll my hand. Oh, okay. All right. But All I right. would like to make a motion. If it's, Yes, uh, absolutely. I'd like to make a motion. Um, that we accept these um, these policy recommendations for consideration of um, a new uh, ordinance within the Hartford Municipal Code. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Motion approved. We'll be following up with you, Miss Haldane. Wonderful job uh, to yourself and uh, and uh, and and the students here. Uh, we'll definitely follow up. We have great role models to follow. And, and one of my <laughs> students uh, says he's going to be mayor of Hartford one day. So I'm just putting everyone on notice. Oh, I mean, listen, he could write, <laughs> if he puts his name and I'll drop out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, all right. Thank you. Thank you all. And, um, and uh, I think you guys got homework tonight. So. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Well, yeah, have, yeah, a yeah. have a wonderful Thank night. You. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are welcome to stay. You guys are welcome to stay. Um, have a good night. Yes, have a good have night. Have a beautiful night. Have a good night. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move on to item 2.3 on the agenda. It's Mayor Bronin with a company resolution to accept a $15,983 grant and state ARPA funding from the Connecticut Department of Aging and Disability Service. I assume that's you, Director Royo. Yes, sir, that is me. Um, so that is funding, additional funding that became available through our NCAA agency, the National uh, our, um, Area Agency on uh, Aging. And so we apply to them every year for funding for several of our programs. You'll be seeing some resolutions for that, I think not in your next meeting, and not in your next council meeting, but the following. Um, and this was additional funding that they had for us to apply for, um, additional ARPA dollars, and we, uh, applied for and received this funding and it's essentially to cover the increased food costs that our centers have been seeing and so uh, this money is to ensure that there's sufficient funding to last for the entire program year uh, for for our program and just you know the elderly nutrition program is the program I always forget just so that everyone knows our elderly nutrition program is the program that is run through our north end senior center and our south end senior center that provides meals, they're not free meals, but provides meals to our residents who are part of the senior center for a small fee. And usually that fee is anywhere from two to $3. All right, I'll open it up to the floor. 
Any questions? Just nice to see Director Arroyo. Uh, Majority Leader Clark, any questions? No questions, sir. All right. Out, uh, the chair entertain a motion. Motion for favorable recommendation back to council. Second. All right. We have a motion on the table that's been properly second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, let the record reflect 2.3 has been sent back favorably to council. All right, so item 2.4, uh, uh, update on direct uh, Department on Health and Human Service. So, so let me just preface this in that um, during our entire time on the as uh, members of the Health and Human Service Committee, we have been mired in the pandemic, uh, COVID and all its variations, Omicron and all the other crons. Uh, and Director Arroyo has been leading us uh, in those efforts, along with uh, everyone here in the committee, through the ebbs and flows, uh, unfortunately, of what the pandemic meant for the city services. A month ago, the President of the United States uh, issued or stated that he was going to be ending the executive order uh, regarding COVID. And so that has many implications, um, uh, really at a high level, what folks in the community have been speaking on is on uh, benefits, state benefits, but there's also uh, ramifications with testing, uh, medical coverage and the likes. And so um, in prompting Director Arroyo for today's presentation, um, uh, I wanted uh, the, the director to talk about the I don't know if I'm using the right language, the ending of COVID or the, you know, there's probably a more proper term that you probably, you will inform us on, but um, the ending of this executive order as it relates to COVID and how the city is preparing for, uh, in the Health and Human Service Department specifically for this ending of the executive order. So director, um, thank you again for attending and the floor is yours. Great, thank you. So, the ending of the executive order by the Biden administration is essentially an acknowledgement that we're moving from the pandemic phase of the of a COVID to what's called the endemic phase of COVID, which means we have a disease that's here to stay, it's not going to go away, and we essentially have to learn how to live with it. Vaccines were very instrumental in helping us get to this phase, as was the fact that as we were seeing the new variants come out, they seemed to be less uh, virulent, so meaning they cause less disease. Now, that's not that's certainly not true for many of our elderly. Our elderly are still very much at risk, which is why uh, vaccination and boosters are critically important for anyone because you just don't know what COVID can do, uh, but especially for our elderly population. And so the state continues to work very closely with our nursing homes. We continue to do a lot of work in, in working with our senior housing and other partners to ensure that we continually have access to the COVID vaccine for our elderly population. But as we move to the endemic phase and the, the learning to live with it phase, a lot of the things that we had as benefits are now going to be absorbed. So I'm gonna talk specifically first about the COVID of related benefits as it related to vaccines, treatment and testing first. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the other um, impacts that we are going to see in, um, or potentially see in the state. So it is, pardon me, I wrote notes because <laughs> it is, um, it's dependent on what your insurance status is, right? So I think the biggest thing to, to know is a lot of things that were free, whether you were insured or uninsured, will no longer be free for the uninsured. And so that's obviously something that we're concerned about. What does that mean if someone's really sick and does really need to go to the hospital? Are they going to not go because now there's this fear of a bill, right? So um, testing will not be free. Vaccines will not be free. Treatment will not be free. So there's like sort of that piece of the puzzle. That's where we, at least on the vaccine side and on the testing side at the city, are trying to become a safety net provider around those issues. And we also have other partners in the community, obviously, that could be safety net providers. Our federally codified community health centers could do things at not no cost, but very reduced cost based on sliding income scale. So those uh, those options will remain, 
they'll just revert back to what they've done in the past, which is have the sliding fee scale for, um, you know, the vaccines or if they're doing testing and things that way, um, things like that. Again, you know, each uh, federally qualified community health center may be different if they're running the lab or if, they're, if the lab is being run by an outside provider in their facility, those things will all be different. But for our uninsured, that's going to be the biggest um, the biggest sort of impact in, that we're going to see. Um, as a, as a municipality and as a state, we're, we're lucky we don't have very high levels of uninsured population, but we also do know that our um, population that is the most uninsured is our Latino population overall in the state, and that would track with the city. So we'll, we'll be looking to see what we can do in, in ensuring that there's access for all members of the community as needed. So to that end, what have we done? Um, we are um, waiting to hear, well, one thing we've done is we have purchased rapid PCR testing machines. So we did that with state funding. It was passed, it was funding from the federal government that came to the state and then was allocated to us based on a number of factors, including our poverty rate, the, the impact of COVID on our community and things like that. So the city is now in possession of three rapid PCR testing machines. They can also test for flu. And so we'll be, um, we're establishing and creating our team was just trained on them recently, and we're establishing and creating some protocols to be able to communicate that to our community and how that would work. And so, um, you know, it, as we're looking also as a clinic to start doing insurance um, billing, which we used to do in the past, uh, that could help us be able to cover some of the costs related to the testing, because there's a contract at this point in time that contract is being covered by state funding that we have for this purpose. And we expect that to continue through 2024 and potentially into 2025. So we'll, we'll be able to be looking at that. We're also, um, so that's one thing. As it relates to vaccines, none of the um, funding sources that we have allow us to purchase vaccines. So that's going to be a very, that's something that we're currently looking at. Um, but we have the ability to place an order before the end of May. And that's something that, or before the, 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 um, the emergency order ends and, and possibly beyond that, because we do know that there's still a supply that the federal government has of vaccine. And so we can continue to order a vaccine for free until that supply runs out. We don't know what that will be or when that will be but we are looking at doing that. We're also waiting to hear back if this is going to be covered under a, um, there's talk of doing like a, a the vaccine for children program, potentially a vaccine for adult uh, program, which would mean that the vaccine is free and there's just a, a, an administrative cost. So how much it costs for us to put it in your arm, to pay the person to put it in your arm. So we're, we're examining that, but that is a big gap as it relates to the purchase of the vaccine. Um, so testing, we're looking to cover. We have the three vaccines. We're going to be working on establishing a system for that. Vaccines, we're thinking through at least um, doing an order that can potentially get us through the end of the year, since the vaccines in deep freezer or in refrigeration can last a certain amount of time. So then you'll be able to do that. Um, but again, our numbers of uninsured are, relatively speaking, to other folks because of their expansion of the ACA our exchange, the fact that we've also expanded um, Husky to individuals under the age of 12 and under. So we have some options there to be able to cover a lot of our folks that are uninsured through through other options. Now, as it relates to this looking at vaccines, um, individuals that are on private insurance, it should continue to stay free, the vaccine, as long as they're in network, that's the expectation. For Medicaid, for anyone on Medicare, Medicaid, or an ACA plan, so you purchase insurance off of the exchange, not from your provider, it's not from your employer, um, they should continue to remain free. As it relates to testing, I think the biggest change you're going to see is access to free testing and access to free at-home test kits. So currently, you're able to order up to eight tests per person per household on your insurance plan, whether you have private insurance or you have um, Medicare, Medicaid, or an ACA plan. Um, and if you're uninsured, you're able to access kits through the uh, online program that the Biden administration set up. And those kits are still available. And we're encouraging people to order kits as well because they're still available to do. Um, so the at-home testing um, will be limited. Um, 
what we're hearing, at least on the Medicaid side, at-home testing kits will be covered until 2024, so that will go beyond, and we do have a sizable population that's covered by Medicaid here in the city. Um, it won't be covered by private insurance, and on Medicare, um, it also won't be covered, but Medicare Advantage plans may be able to pick that up. So we're waiting to see how some of this plays out. And then essentially, um, you know, lab tests would have to be ordered by a physician. Like currently, we can go to Quest and just go online to so the program that state has, go in, get a free PCR test, and, and that's covered. That's also going to change. So some of this is a little bit wait and see, but these are some of the impacts that we're seeing. And then the biggest thing is treatment. So the government purchased Paxlovid, they purchased the monoclonal antibodies, they provided them, and um, that was free. We weren't charged. So if you received that, you weren't charged. You might have been charged for the office visit, but you weren't charged for the actual medication. And so um, that will remain the same until the supply that currently exists runs out. We don't know when that'll run out, but at least on the Paxlovid, we're hearing until the middle of the year. Um, I'm sorry, I have children in the background. Can you please give me a minute? Some of you can read lips. I just said I, I need you both of you to stop. Nothing else. <laughs> um, so again, we're waiting to see. And then uh, on the monoclonal antibodies, not so much of an impact simply because what we have found uh, is the current set of monoclonal antibodies that we have were not, uh, were not effective against the Omicron. Um, and so that had been removed in many cases. But again, um, that was free. And even if you were uninsured, there was uh, uh, access to costs being covered by the federal government that are not going to be covered anymore as a result of this. So that's the big picture as it relates to vaccines, testing, and treatment. It's a little bit of a mixed bag and what that impact will actually be on us is, is depending, uh, you know, Medicare people, are med if they're dual eligibles and they have Medicaid, they can get it through there, which we have a large amount of that in the city. If they're not dual eligibles, will, me will Medicare Advantage plan cover that? And then on Medicaid, they're good until 2024. And then I'm sure there'll probably be some things that'll happen there. Other things that will have a, a big impact, I think most folks know that during the pandemic, the recertification for eligibility for Medicaid was suspended, which was a huge thing. So if you recall, you had to, I can't remember, I think it's twice a year, you had to submit your information to make sure that you were still eligible for Medicaid. And that was suspended during the pandemic, that's coming back. And so states now have 14 months, it's, that process is already starting, now have 14 months to recertify everyone on their roles. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone that has access is going to lose access. And you, if you recall, there was also an expansion of, of Medicaid in, in certain instances um, as well. That doesn't mean that everyone that had it is going to lose it because they may be eligible for other programs now. And so that process will start. And as you know, in Connecticut, I believe you have like one-stop shop, you apply and you can see that you're eligible for all programs rather than doing all these little tiny applications to figure things out. And so as folks go through that process, um, the, the goal is that they will find if they're eligible for another plan or something else that they can then um, roll over into. But I do suspect that some folks may fall off and they can fall off potentially because they now have jobs that are paying them more money um, and they have access to other means to do that. And then the last one is, um, I, and again, this is in terms of the impact that people may feel is obviously the food stamps. So the pandemic related increases in food stamps have been phased out. So we're the we're in the last batch of 33 states that hadn't yet phased it out. And so in February, the last pandemic related uh, distribution of um, SNAP benefits is now gone. And so just for context, what we're seeing um, here in Connecticut from national groups that have done a um, a analysis of what that means to, to Connecticut and just pulling it up. The state of Connecticut is going to lose $34 million of federal funds per month. So starting this month, $34 million less. Um, we know that it's 219,686 households, more than that. So let's say, you know, about 220,000 households in the state are affected. Um, and on average, again, this is the average, um, Part, each SNAP participant will lose $82 a month. 
And the biggest impact is really going to be felt by our elderly population. So um, the minimum benefit um, uh, that people can have was $23 a month. That increased with this pandemic benefit. So it went from $281 because they were getting 256 additional dollars to $23. So our elderly population is going to have a huge impact. Um, so that is obviously one thing that we are going to keep an eye on. What we hear, what we're hearing, or what I've read from other states that have ended, that ended it uh, prior to this. So one place was Atlanta, the Atlanta Food Bank is saying that the number of people coming to their food, to their food bank, to the food banks that they're serving is as high as it was during the height of the pandemic. Um, so that's the impact that they're feeling right now. And so I have not heard anything from any of the food banks currently, but I do know the CEO had been on the news talking about this and the expected increase that they would could potentially be seeing. We've not had phone calls at the office at this point in time. Maybe folks haven't necessarily really realized that because the disbursement was in two, my understanding is that disbursement happened in two waves. So you had your first normal um, snap disbursement and then a second one came in the middle of the month. When that second one doesn't hit the, in the middle of this month, that might be something that we start hearing about. Um, but at this point, it's not, it's not um, something that we've heard. I think some other things that insulate us a tiny bit is unlike other municipalities, we have community eligibility for uh, free and reduced school lunch. So all of our children are able to access free lunch, unlike other municipalities. So um, that strain for, for families that are losing some of these EBT benefits, the SNAP benefits, um, was being even more painfully felt because your children were not having free lunch either. Uh, that's not something that that is in the city because we have community eligibility. So that is something that is a little bit of a buffer for us. Um, but again, the the full impact remains to be seen. And then lastly, there are a lot of other sort of arcane things that happen in the federal government that are affected by this that wouldn't affect our daily lives really just how, gov how government agencies are able to work together, some regulations that um, uh, were modified as a result of this. So for example, the big, you know, if you think about the big thing is the emergency use authorizations, that process will go back to its normal process and things like that. So there'll be other things that happen behind the scenes that are affected by this, but are not things that we would feel an impact of. What I highlighted were the things that we would most likely see or feel an impact of either as an individual or as a municipality. Wow, amazing, amazing. Thank you uh, for the update. And it, it seems that, uh, not seems, I know um, with you at the helm that um, we are bracing for whatever potential impact. And it seems that uh, we have an understanding um, let me open it up. Uh, let me open up the floor to my council colleagues, Councilwoman Rosetti. You know, first of all, thank you, Director Arroyo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can honestly, clearly remember sitting in City Hall in February of 2020 at a probably first or second Health and Human Services Committee meeting. Was it the first one? When I said this isn't going to be a big deal, we're fine. Yeah, well, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're, and you know what? I have to say, you really eased me at that time. You said we're going to be cautious. You know, it was very, um, it was, it was, it was, it was perfect. And you've continued to keep that level of expertise of weighing, you know, urgency and and you know, and again. For the work I'm in with the people experiencing homelessness, and I, I say this all the time, we we made that population such a priority because they were so vulnerable and so at risk. And you know how many emails you got from me and Fred. So, you know, again, and, and as an organization that just this week, because we have state contracts, we're able to stop wearing masks at work three years three years. It was almost, I don't even know how to do it really. I don't even know how to go in the building and not do it. It almost becomes a part of you, but I, I you know, I want to, I want to thank you for your continued um, 
level-headedness, if that's a word, is that a word? It behooves me to know the correct words, but I don't know them. Um, but I really, I cannot thank you enough, but I, I I was just sitting here when you were talking, when we, I remember we'd always say when it goes from pandemic to endemic and which it will probably always be, but I really clearly, Nick, was it the first one? I can really remember that first meeting. And yeah, then, I can give you the contents. Uh, Director Arroyo wasn't, wasn't too happy with me. Uh, oh, at well, the time. I uh, say that's okay. so I mean, hard we, we, to believe, but yeah, I mean, um, well, it's because like it was just a couple cases in Seattle yeah. and uh, I wanted to um, bring it up as an agenda item and she oh. entertained my, um, she entertained became, my thought process. It became our, our lives, but I, I again, I thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a note, I was like looking at my Facebook messages. Today is the third anniversary of when the city held its meeting with all of the providers yeah so it, and it was a week before we had our first case um we got our first case a week later uh so again it was it, it's you know it's this is when it all was starting for us right like we had been talking about it and preparing for it and updating plans but this was the day that we really kicked off march 6th was the day of 2020 that we really kicked off our planning for the city and, you know, little did we know a week later, we'd be putting that plan into action. Right, we shut down and uh, I just remember like, not even having my voicemail set up and the pandemic was coming. Um, wow. Um, Majority Leader Clark, any questions, comments? No, Mr. Chair, um, I try not to relive those uh, days of COVID. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to get past this thing. Yeah, ready for the endemic. Uh, so, just one question um, in terms of uh, Director Arroyo, you know, you have all these major initiatives, but um, oftentimes the 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 relationship or the service delivery systems where we're actually engaging uh, community members and residents um, are are staff communicating with. Um, the, the 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 community about the potential coming up, like for example, the recertification proce uh, process regarding regarding SNAP benefits, you know, um, the vaccines, the uninsured piece. Like, how has that communication uh, been with the community? So a lot of around SNAP that's coming directly from DSS um, beneficiaries. Uh, my understanding have been notified. Um, we don't do SNAP at our office, so it's harder for us to access that information, although we know that a lot of our families are obviously SNAP eligible. Um, in terms of moving forward, we're, are, we're looking at doing a push in April around this. Um, we, did, we considered doing a push around ordering home tests prior to that, but there is a shelf life on home tests, and so right, waiting right. a little bit later in the process could be better, right? So for instance, uh, probably at the beginning of May, I'll go and get a supply mm -hmm. using my insurance for, you know, for my family and, and have some, some constancy that, that at least that supply will last me through the winter versus getting something that earlier and then it expiring by the time I actually may need it. Right. So we're going to be pushing um, ordering on and we have put out ordering online um, through the existing process uh, with the Biden administration, where you can get up to four free box, uh, four free tests to your home. Uh, we'll also be putting out messaging as well to uh, any individual with uh, any insurance, Medicaid, private, or, or what it is to be able to do that. And then again, we will roll out the PCR testing and it is going to be um, Hartford only, Hartford residents only. I, I hate to do that, but right. <laughs> limited resources and other municipalities have other health districts have also received funding from the state to be able right. to do some of this work. And you know, we were really a big provider of vaccines to not only Hartford, but we had lots of folks come from Windsor and Bloomfield because we had people that looked like them and they felt comfortable with us. And so we're, we're thinking through how we can continue to serve them in a low cost way mm -hmm. um, moving forward as well because they're they're integrated in our community they come into work in our community they shop in our community so they're still a part of us but we do in terms of our resources like we did with the vaccine when we initially did the rollout 
we only did Hartford residents. We, well, the first two weeks we didn't, then we put a stop to that, and then we only did Hartford residents um, until later in, uh, until later in the rollout of the vaccines. I think it was not until mm, after April, probably like May is when we started vaccinating individuals from outside of the city again. Right. But those first uh, four and a half months, we really focused on city residents. And so we want to make sure that we're using our resources wisely and uh, working to be able to provide the services that we can, uh, prioritizing our residents first always. So, uh, yeah, so just, um, just a comment. Um, you know, my other daytime hat uh, is uh, working with um, families uh, who receive uh, state benefits. And I know that we're relying on the state to, you know, communicate with the families. Far as I know, it's only been letters. The state system uh, mailed home snail mail, if you will. And um, they do have emails, but I mean, they're not landing. And so um, ever since the the DSS changed its interface with its um, families that it's working with, where they've gone from case manager to more of a bank teller type. It is a better word for that. Um, the relationships have been reduced. And so families are feeling uh, not attached to the department. And so my fear is that um, the the low hanging fruit efforts that the state is taking, particularly <clears throat> communicating this to a marginalized community um, and often disenfranchised community um, is going to have a, a really um, negative effect, but you know, blessings to, um, um, to them all. And I just, you know, hope if there's any opportunity to communicate this or maybe have some kind of communication plan to the city or maybe partnering with the state. I don't know what that looks like. I just know that um, with my kid, with, with the work that I do, we're informing people all the time and helping them with that because there is still a lack of awareness. But um, with that being said, um, just one last question, director. I know you got the babies um, um, your children there. Um, just in terms of the budget season coming up, were there any adjustments in your budget requests in regards to this um, potential uh, need to serve to serve um, community residents, particularly in the areas of um, you know testing and and COVID things and things of that nature? So on testing, no, just because we feel that we have. We, with Medicaid being covered through the end of 2024, there's right. some security there for a large part of our population, right? We do have, like, again, we have a lot of dual eligibles. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then with our own testing machines that we've purchased with state funds, um, we're actually in the process of redoing our, our contracts with that to see what we can, um, what we can use and have available. And we're also expanding that to include flu for residents. So we have that piece of the work that we think, um, can be a stopgap measure on this. We are also on the vaccines. We decided to wait and see because we're hearing very promising news that this that there's something in development at the federal government level. And so we're preparing ourselves to be able to enroll in that program, uh, to be able to have the access for that. So the only thing uh, for us is the, is the coverage of the vaccines. And if, if that's covered, we can put the vaccines in arms. We have the capacity to do that uh, with the current grants that we have. Um, and then again, over time, as this become, becomes endemic, it was just recently added to the listing of um, recommended vaccines for adults. So once those things happen, then they start getting covered by insurance and, and other places. And then again, it's how can we ensure um, and work with with our partners to cover those that are that are uninsured, and that'll be the biggest thing. And so we're still trying to dig our hands around that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's we know that there's still a vaccine available. Could we purchase and stock it until that this winter, and then only focus on an uninsured population? That's something right. we can consider doing as well. Thank you. And like I said, we're still there's still grants yeah, out there. Yeah, there's that still we're so asking. much. Yeah. There's still grants. The issue is always buying a vaccine. And it's hard to say, city, buy a vaccine. It's going to be $130 a pop because that's what they're talking about charging right now. It's really hard to put that on the on our municipality. Um, 
and, and then to be able to manage that it's only hard for residents and all of that kind of crazy stuff like for us it's been we we've not checked since last may um who who we're vaccinating because we've had the ability with state funds to be able to do this and we and we foresee that ability continuing because we know that we have funds allocated through at least the middle of 2024 which we think will go beyond that and we're in the process of applying um for some additional funds right now through uh our reach project so you'll see a resolution for that as well for uh for app, uh, applying and approving and, and accepting funds through our uh, through that process, so we're looking at money for that, which would also cover administration, but it won't cover paying for the vaccine. So I think when right. we get to that, if it's not being covered in any other way by the feds or the state, then we would entertain another conversation about what do we want to do, how do we want to do that, how do we work with our community about that. Yeah, I mean a lot of it, um, director. Really, the. The municipalities bear the burden and i'll just go on my soapbox and i end with this it really was a miss on the federal level of holding uh pharma accountable and um, i think from a policy standpoint at the federal level we you know it was just like okay let's just get these thing out there but really not having the foresight to you know cap for example what these things are going to cost or negotiate with pharma uh, it was just like, let's get it out there and not worry about the cost. And now the cost may very well cost us, if you will. Um, so, um, but anyway, nonetheless, Director, thank you uh, for that. And I appreciate your efforts. I don't, and your communication and your leadership as always. Um, I believe that this committee holds you in such high esteem. I want to speak for all the members. So um, with that being said, now seeing no more items and it being a long meeting, I'll take a motion to adjourn, Councilwoman Rosetti. So moved. All right, second. All Correct. right, bye, everyone. Uh, thank bye. you, Councilman Clark. Yes, all right. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, okay, bye.